currents of thought have emerged as a result of the San Bernardino attacks. One is that we'll witness a wave of anti-Muslim sentiment in the United States. The other involves the role of Islam itself in the attacks. Is the Islamic extremism espoused by ISIS a warped distortion of Islam, or does it tap into a strain of Islamic thought? To discuss this, I'm joined by Dalia Mogahed, Research Director at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, and Azra Nomani, author of Standing Alone, An American Woman's Struggle for the Soul of Islam. Uh, let me start with this question for both of you, Dalia. Is, it, is ISIS uh, preaching a strain of Islam? I would say that ISIS wants us to think so, and I think that's the real danger here, is that what ISIS wants the narrative to be is that they are the true Muslims, that they are standing with true Islam, and everyone else, people like me and Asra, are the apostates. Mm -hmm. And if we give in to their narrative, we're actually doing their propaganda for them. And I think we should really take that to heart and, and think long and hard about it. When Dylan Roof walked into a black church, he wanted to start a race war. Mm -hmm. We didn't let him do that because we didn't cast him as a representative of the white race. Mm -hmm. We didn't give in to his narrative. We did the exact opposite. And I think that we have to be careful not to give in to the apocalyptic narrative of ISIS that wants to start a war between Muslims and everybody else. Now, everybody seems to agree with that. Azra, I know you've argued, though, that, that Muslims need to take back their religion. Yeah, we absolutely. From ISIS. How? We, how? we absolutely do. We are doing it. On Friday, I stood with a group of brave and courageous Muslims, and we stood and we provided a declaration to the world of reform. We ca are calling ourselves the Muslim reform movement, mm -hmm. and we are opposing a very real interpretation of Islam that espouses violence, social injustice, and political Islam. And what we did is we walked through the gates of the Islamic Center of Washington here in D.C. that's very much run by the government of Saudi Arabia, and we posted our precepts on the door of that mosque because the problem is not simply in Syria. The problem is sitting in the birthplace of Islam in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, where this interpretation of Islam has gone out into the world over the last four decades, creating militancy groups from Indonesia to now San Bernardino, California's mm -hmm. vicious attack. We have to take back the faith, and we have to take it back with a principles of peace, social justice, and human rights, women's rights, and secularized yeah. governance. Dahlia, when, when people, when Americans find out, uh, we're learning more about um, the woman here, we find out that her own family is saying, yeah, she became really religious and she changed. Americans are going to see that as the more religious a Muslim is, right. the more likely they're going to end up uh, somehow uh, uh, fighting for ISIS cause. I can understand that. I think those are real fears. I think we have to keep a few things in mind, though. Um, this particular couple, we're learning more and more about them. First of all, they, uh, they actually stopped going to the mosque about two years ago. Another thing that many people aren't talking about is that they targeted the only Muslim in the room and shot that woman four times. It was actually someone that used to go to their mosque. It's very hard to understand what inspired these people. Um, but what we know broadly from research is that religiosity does not correlate with sympathy for terrorism. It's actually quite the opposite. The more religious someone is, the more often they go to the mosque, the more right. likely they are to actually reject attacks on civilians. I want to expand the conversation here. Let me bring everybody else here. We've got Amy Walter, Cook for Political Report, Rich Lowry from National Review, Charles Ogletree, professor at Harvard, Elizabeth B. Miller from the New York Times. Uh, Rich, why don't you fire away? Well, it seems to me that this debate, whether Islam is a religion of peace or not, really, it's irrelevant for outsiders. It's for Muslims to decide whether it's a religion of peace or not. And if they, enough of them do, then you cut off the oxygen to the radicals. But at the moment, the extremists have significant financial, popular, and theological backing in the Middle East. And that is an enduring uh, phenomenon, and it's one that's going to require a long ideological war to win. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to disagree with you. They simply do not have ideological, theological, or popular support. And I mean, this is a criminal organization that is funding their uh, their criminality with things like drug trade and selling oil. They they do not have the ideological support that you're describing at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. They've had um, a, number of voices from across the spectrum say that they what they're doing is completely un-Islamic. They have no support popularly in terms of the general public. 
Um, so but yet they're they, still they're, there. Yeah. They're yeah. still there, yeah. but, but so think, are many other terrorist organizations. The, and their primary, their primary the victims loudest. are Muslims. I think that's and, very important to and keep And to in that mind. point, I think what speaks the loudest and what speaks to your point is the blood that's spilling from Australia to now California. I mean, how much blood has to be spilt until we recognize inside of a Muslim community that we do have an ideological problem and that we do have support? I mean, I there are the hundreds spilling in there Syria, hundreds, and it's mostly there are Muslims. Hundreds and hundreds of followers of Islamic State around Europe and the U.S. The studies are showing this, I and think. all you have to do is look at the the conversation inside of our mosques and inside of our communities, and you will hear it, and I hear it. And I have to say that I saw it in 2002, went to Islamabad, Pakistan, and met women who were supporting this ideology. I called them the Taliban Ladies Auxiliary back then. This young woman in California would have been a star member of it. That's right. Go ahead, Elizabeth. I had actually, after the Paris attacks in this country, we all patted ourselves on the back and said, well, we have a much more assimilated Muslim population here than they do in Europe. But does this attack um, uh, put that to, I mean, does that give you pause now? Are we wrong about that? When we talk about a wall, right, to try to keep out these, this threat, but the problem is that these are ideas and they are filtering throughout the world. And it, would, it is naive and I think ultimately the reason why we as Muslims stood on Friday and went to the mosque and took these risks on our own lives is because we've had enough. Like the world has had enough. Mm -hmm. We and have That's an important thing. That requires that bravery to do what she's talking about. But, but I'm hearing here that this Muslim movement were for women is what we have to focus on. And women have been doing, I think, the right thing, having the conversations, talking to people about that. And I, I hate this idea that we, as Americans, are going to say we're going to have a sense at the border, someplace else, to figure out whether Muslims can come to the United States. Muslims have a right to every other people like every, to come to the United States. Right. And, and, and we have to be concerned about the gun killing are people who are Americans, who are Irish, uh, who are English, uh, who are all around the country. Just and as, so we don't want to just find as that. Just as we don't want to bury our heads in the sand about right. serious issues, you know, a meme is now circulating that's called the Ostrich Brigade. Yep. And it's used to describe all those people who are burying their heads in the sand. I call it the 3D strategy. It's denial, deflection, and then demonization of those of us who want to speak honestly about these issues of extremism. And Dahlia, we have to do it. This is a book called Women in the Shade of Islam. It's published by the government of Saudi Arabia. I picked it up in Pakistan where the Taliban Ladies Auxiliary and our young wife in California mm -hmm. would have picked up an item like this. And it puts out that Salafi Wahhabi ideology that is ultimately the toxic poison that is crossing all these borders. Dali, I want you to have the last word. I think it's important to understand that ISIS's biggest enemy are ordinary Muslims. That's why they're fleeing. That's why they are the primary victims of ISIS. Muslims are, are the, the, uh, the ones who want to do the most to defeat this ideology. It's important that we don't do their propaganda for them by giving them the legitimacy that they crave. All right. Um, so I just Dalia, wanna, we'll go ahead and I just want to say one last right, word, right. which is this is the declaration, and we're going to share this with we'll, the world we'll, because we'll this, is the, our, this we'll, is the Islam that we want to see in the we'll world. We'll let people that want to see more on that, uh, we'll let them, uh, we'll put the link on our, on our uh, website. All right.